In today's video, we're going to be diving into the upcoming pattern where there is a lot to discuss in the tropics. We have obviously Hurricane Aaron. We have two tropical disturbances behind it in the Atlantic, and we do actually expect pretty major impacts along coastal North Carolina, and now even some stretching up into the mid-Atlantic from our current hurricane, which is projected to track closer to the East Coast than it even was yesterday. We've really seen this thing consistently trend south and west day after day after day, and if it keeps doing that, it's only going to get worse and worse. With all of that being said, we're also going to be taking a look at a very fall-like pattern It looks to take over here late in August and into September with far below average temperatures that last for days as an Arctic blast or maybe even two move down from Canada into the central and eastern states. This even has the potential to force us into a nor'easter pattern, which is a very fall characteristic, not a late summer one at all. And we expect maybe one two or even three nor'easter type systems to take place as well. So there is a whole lot to discuss today. So let's first off take a look at the tropics. And again, with Hurricane Aaron, we do actually see this track and this cone is much closer uh, to the coastline of North Carolina than it's really been uh, at all so far. And if it does track, let's say on the very far western side, that is not a lot of distance. We would get uh, not only just outer bands impacting these areas, but kind of like mid-range bands that are sort of uh, closer to the core of the storm, it's almost a certainty that we're going to be seeing tropical storm-like conditions along the Outer Banks, but there's the possibility that we maybe even see uh, conditions that are even worse than that, maybe even approaching like Category 1 hurricane-type winds, especially for Hatteras Island there that pokes out the furthest into the ocean. Uh, but really, we expect potential impacts throughout this entire area. We even have coastal flooding uh, advisories up for a lot of the Mid-Atlantic. You'll have to check your lo local National Weather Service. But we do see a lot of it throughout southeastern Virginia. I think I saw some here along the Delmarva. So definitely some impacts stretching into the Mid-Atlantic as well. With that being said, we have two other threats behind it as well to discuss. This one here on the front end is about the same as it was yesterday. A 10% chance of developing over the next two days and a 60% chance of developing over the next seven. So certainly uh, looking likely that this one develops. We've seen a lot of model guidance come in and actually show this one uh, curving to the north, which yesterday we saw a lot of them kind of skirting it more towards the southeast area of the United States. This is obviously a massive difference there is days to go until this one's occurring, so there is a lot of time uh, for things to wiggle around or change. And even now, we see the GFS model on the very, very far southern side of this little uh, risk area. And it's interesting that this one already is showing signs of maybe being a little bit too far to the east, such as what we saw with Aaron. But time will tell. We do see this one here just off of Africa, which is going to be risk number three for the most part. Uh, and this one has a 30% chance of development over the next three and the next seven days. We'll have to see if this one follows in the footsteps of these two systems or if it doesn't make it out of the middle of the Atlantic and really ends up being a non-event. Time will tell with all of this stuff, but nevertheless, we're seeing the tropics just explode with activity. Now, as we move on to the European model to just look at some of our storminess, we'll also get some insight for Hurricane Aaron. Uh, for the, again, East Coast, and maybe some other tropical activity. And then outside of that, we're going to be talking about the very fall-like conditions that we've been talking about for a while now. Here's by tomorrow afternoon, which is when we're really going to start to see things going downhill as far as conditions in North Carolina. Already, you can see there's the potential for some very, very outer showers from Hurricane Aaron, maybe even for South Carolina, definitely for North Carolina, and maybe upwards up into the Mid-Atlantic. And I would imagine by this point, 5 p.m. Wednesday, we're already going to see the wind type conditions going downhill. We're going to see the waves getting much larger out there. This is going to be where things start to descend into uh, the, the worst of it. And by the time we're looking at Thursday, I would say morning time frame, 11 a.m. here, this might be the worst point for the Outer Banks where we have some moderate rainfall happening for parts of the Delmarva, Southeast Virginia, and especially, again, Eastern North Carolina. And you could tell 
uh, that a lot of the worst of it is not very far from the Outer Banks there. So again, if this storm trickles any closer, we're going to be seeing much more major impacts. And of course, there is still a couple of days for this thing to trend west, which has been the theme all along with this storm. So we do lean that way. It's either probably going to stay on the current trajectory or trend west. But you cannot disregard the possibility that this one does trend to the east and we actually see the outlook for conditions to actually improve so there's a little bit of wiggle room here over the next couple of days with this but it is awfully close so we don't expect major changes uh, in the expected impacts or anything but it is possible still and by thursday afternoon we see this one is starting to move away and certainly by thursday evening this is 2 a.m on friday morning and you can see that most of the rain is done. The storm is much further away from these East Coast locations. And the worst of it should be done by this point. Right around this time frame, Saturday the 23rd, is when our fall-like pattern is going to start to take shape. Which is fitting that we're kind of just segueing into one topic right into the next. They don't happen simultaneously. They happen back to back. We do see this pretty significant ridge out west. And then this trough that is trying to get going. So we're creating this imbalance as this warm air rushes up the west coast. We see this bubbling up. And this is forcing all of the cold air to spill over towards the east. And that's why we're starting to see this trough move into the east. We do still see a lot of upward movement along the east coast. This will be eventually shoved out by this trough that's moving in. But for the time being, this might create... Uh, a lot of rainy conditions, even thunderstorms or even severe weather there along the southeast uh, as we get this rush of warm, humid air moving up the east ahead of this uh, Arctic blast. Now, as we keep going towards Sunday on the 24th, we can also see we have this really, really broad low pressure system there between the Great Lakes and Hudson Bay. We mentioned this yesterday, but we've been using this as a signal for years. But when we see a low move through this area with the cold front underneath it, that just really tends to be an omen for very cool air compared to normal moving in. We do see it in this case, so maybe this is going to be another year where this is a really strong indicator. We do have this really intense cold front, and there is thunderstorms building along it. So I wouldn't really rule out the fact that we could see intense thunderstorms or even severe weather along this line as well, as we have very cold, dry air moving in uh, to very humid, hot weather. That's just a recipe for things to really, really pick up steam. So we're going to be watching that very closely. Again, that's next weekend on Sunday. Here's Monday the 25th. And what we see is that that cold front does die down for the most part. There's still some heavier showers or thunderstorms ongoing for the northeast and eastern Canada as well. We also see some storminess along the Rockies here and even some of the central plains. But by this point, we can really tell we're in a deep, deep trough in the east here. Much cooler air compared to normal is in place. We start to see some of this storminess swing around. So again, it originates in this kind of area here. It moves around and it wants to swing up the coast. This is a classic, classic nor'easter track. Typically don't see this in August, but we are seeing it here. It doesn't make it all the way up the east coast, but we see another one trying to form there off the southeast again. And then we do finally get one that moves up in a very classic fashion here. It develops off the southeast right at the end of August. This is August 31st. And it starts to move up the Carolina coast, the mid-Atlantic, into the northeast there, impacting southern New England as a classic nor'easter. It's not a very major one. It's not like a crazy low pressure system or anything, but it would be a pretty interesting heavy rainmaker. It even looks like we have more that are trying to develop in here very similarly. We mentioned this yesterday, but this would be very easy and realistic to see any of these really transition into a more tropical type system and become a tropical depression or tropical storm. So we're going to be watching for those threats with these nor'easters as well. We know that those can kind of go hand in hand. So with this matching up with kind of the near peak of the hurricane season, we're going to want to watch for that possibility for sure. The total precipitation is quite elevated along the four corner states, some of the plains here, as well as the Gulf states and up the East Coast here. These are some of the main areas we're watching. And when we look at the anomalies, it's pretty clear, again, above average throughout these regions, above average for much of the immediate East Coast, as well as a lot of this kind of Southeast area in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, where we're well above average as far as precipitation. And then we see this below average blob here for the great lakes midwest ohio valley 
where we're pretty considerably below average as far as precipitation actually in these areas. And that definitely is coming after we've seen a very wet spell for probably a month plus. So it shouldn't be much of a problem unless it lasts very long, which of course we'll keep you updated on. Looking at the temperatures, of course it's not terribly cool right now or anything. We do see some cooler air around for the Midwest, Ohio Valley and Great Lakes, as well as the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast. This is kind of just typical stuff. This isn't coming from an Arctic blast or anything. It's more just stagnant cool air, maybe some backdoor cold fronts moving down. Uh, the real true Arctic blast is going to be forming a little bit after this point. We see the warmer air starting to build out west. We see this cooler air up here over western Canada. Very typical. What's going to happen after this warm air pushes that cold air out of the way is it's again going to spill over and move down. That's the effect that we're going to see start to take place. So we see that warmth building and watch what's happening. It builds way up into eastern Canada just a few days later. This is Saturday on the 23rd. We have a very rich area of cooler air here and that is primed to move right into the central and eastern states. This is less than five days out. This is four days away. So confidence is really, really high in this upcoming major cooldown. Uh, we've been talking about this since it was very far out. So confidence wasn't always as high as it is, but it is climbing for sure. It almost peaked. Sunday, 24th moving in. Monday, the 25th. And look, these greens are 10 to 15 degrees below normal. That's not slightly below normal temperatures. That is a drastically uh, different temperature than what you're averaging. And it can be the difference between hot and room temperature, or perhaps room temperature and cooler if we're talking about lows to even chilly. Uh, this is the types of temperature anomalies that can make it feel like a different season. Uh, after all, it's the summertime, but it's going to make it feel like the fall. Uh, so it is quite intense. We see as this moves down, it's still around by uh, Wednesday here on the 27th, Thursday on the 28th, uh, th Saturday here on the 30th. We're finally seeing things warm up a little bit here at the very tail end of August. We do have more Arctic air right here. And this could move down. Uh, it's kind of dodged this area on this particular model run, which is interesting because we have a really, really healthy positive PNA. So I wouldn't be shocked if this little detail here is a bit different in the east. Time will tell. But we kind of stick with the messy pattern, a little bit of cooler weather, a little bit of warmer weather here around. Nothing too crazy. But when we move over to the GFS model, we're going to see... It's a little different, more intense with the cold air that moves in. This is Monday on the 25th. The greens are again 10 to 15 degrees below normal, but these purplish blues in here are 15 to 25 degrees below normal. Uh, so 25 degrees below normal. Imagine your average temperature is 100. First off, I'd feel bad for you, but second off, 100 degrees is your average temperature. If it's 25 degrees below normal, it's 75 out. That is a huge difference. That is unsurvivably hot down to what you keep your house at. So that is that is a crazy, crazy difference of temperature there. Uh, again, you know, 75 versus 50 or 50 versus 25. Just to put it into perspective, uh, we even see some of these magentas uh, pulling up, which are 25 degrees or more below normal, about 30 degrees below normal in this instance here over some of the central plains on the GFS model. This sticks around for Wednesday the 27th, Thursday the 28th. We see this really last, especially in the eastern and southeastern states, all the way past the first into the second. Uh, but the only thing that I am uh, I have a problem with here on this GFS model is we still see the cooler air around for the southeast, which I guess is technically possible. But we really do see a flip in this PNA on this particular model run. We see cooler temperatures trending in for the west once we reach into September. And this would likely encourage a lot more warmth than this model is showing for this time frame. So I think that what we want to really watch in the long range here is this western area. Is it warmer? Is it cooler? If it's warmer, it's going to be cooler in the east most likely. If it's if it's warmer out here uh, or if it's cooler in this area, then likely it's going to be much warmer here in these parts. So we're going to be watching that closely for you guys as we continue to keep you up to date with this pattern. With all that being said, be sure to subscribe. We upload every single day. You can even hit the bell icon for daily notifications when we upload so you never miss one. Be sure to like the video if you did enjoy it. Leave a comment down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.